I'm Nick Morgan, and this is the What the Speak podcast. Do you kick ass when you speak, present, or pitch? If not, these expert discussions and insider tips can help you right now, today. Welcome to the What the Speak podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kelly. Um... <laughs> what, what, what? Research in 2009 by Pablo Bernal revealed that by simply taking a posture of confidence, people feel more confident. Now there's a device that can help you with this. It's called LumoLift, and I've already pre-ordered mine. If you'd like to boost your confidence when speaking in public through better posture, check out whatthespeak.com slash lift to watch the video and grab one for yourself. Nick Morgan, are you ready to answer the question, what the speak? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. So, Nick, I am so excited to have you on the show. I, of course, love every guest that I bring on to speak with, but you are somebody I've been really interested to talk with. So, what I want to do is first mention that you are one of America's top communication theorists. I don't even know what that is. We'll talk about that in a minute. You're also a coach for many uh, top speakers that are out there right there right now today. The other thing is you're the author of several books, which are fascinating reads, including your newest one, Power Cues, which is going to be coming out in May. And you're also a fantastic keynote speaker on the topic of public speaking. But let's hear it directly from you. Can you share with us briefly who you are and exactly what it is that you do? Oh, sure. And thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. This is fun. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in it. Most of the time, I'm a coach. Um, about a third of the time, I'm a keynote speaker, and we work with mostly individuals, a lot of professional speakers, uh, and, but we also work with some companies to help them on their uh, executive uh, coaching, executive communications, as well as uh, how they brand themselves and how they think about themselves. We, we basically tell people we're storytellers, and we, so we help people figure out how to tell powerful stories. And nowadays, as you know, the world is awash in information, and, and it's hard to get people's attention and hard to get them to pay attention for longer than eight seconds. So our, that's our job is to figure out how, how to get people to do that. Tell them stories so compelling they can't resist. They do pay attention. Fantastic. Well, we all need help with that. That's for sure. So, Nick, I also wanted to ask, you know, I know you talk about public speaking as a broad topic, but when you're asked to speak in front of an audience, what are some of the various topics that you usually are presenting? Well, I just spoke uh, to 4,500 salesmen wow. on the subject of storytelling. And I think uh, that blew my mind, just the sheer numbers of them. And it probably blew their minds, too, to, to uh, think about storytelling as something that they have to do if they're going to connect with clients. Yeah. So, that, so that's a lot of fun. I enjoy that. That's, uh, that's one topic, storytelling. I think my, my favorite after that is body language. And that's something that people are always curious about. And I get to do some demonstrations with the audience, and those are funny. Um, and it involves no hypnosis, by the way. <laughs> so your mind at rest. Uh, and then, and then as, you, as you note, I talk about presentations and executive presence, how you show up to command attention. And that's really what uh, Power Cues is about, how you take control of your, uh, your communication so that you show up with a kind of of presence that people need these days. Got it. So now let's talk a little bit about your personal story, the origins of how you got involved with with speaking and speech writing and all the things that go into this uh, and what you're focused on today. And also, really, you know, we're curious about your your journey as a speaker as well, not just somebody who teaches. So where did this all begin for you? Was it something that when you were a kid, you you had this just desire to do this or you know how did it start for you well three things happened when i was 17 that caused me to have a lifelong interest in communications body language and storytelling uh, first of all i read a book about the dalai lama and he became a hero second i learned my father was gay mm. and third i died wow so let me take those three in order very quickly uh, so I read a book about the Dalai Lama. He became a hero of mine. I had a chance to see him in person about six years after that. And he was late 
And it didn't matter. He was about an hour late. In fact, everybody waited. Of course, he was the incarnate Dalai Lama. You had to wait, right? Yeah. <laughs> do. But uh, what, when he sat down to speak, he just looked at us. He didn't say anything for four minutes of stage time. And I was just completely amazed by that because something powerful happened in those four minutes. It was it, it was as if he connected with each one of us individually. So that was, that was the first thing I wanted to know. How did he do that? What was going on there? What was the body language that was passing between us that felt so powerful? His speech was great, too. But what I really remember were those four minutes of silence. Hmm. So uh, back to age 17, I have to buy a Christmas present for my dad. And he's a difficult man to buy a present for. But Ian e. Forster has just come out. Uh, with a book, Ian e. Forster has been dead for 50 years at that point, but a book has been posthumously uh, published. And the reason it was uh, held away from publication for 50 years was because it was about his homosexuality, which was illegal in his day. So so it's published 50 years afterwards. I'm kind of dimly aware of this backstory, but not really thinking about it. I just thought Ian e. Forster, classic writer, I'll get that for my dad for Christmas, a nice book. It's safe, right? So I, I wrap it up put it under the tree, and when he opens it on Christmas Day, he gives me this look for a nanosecond, just, just a quick look. And a wheel turns in my head, and I say, oh, my God, my dad is gay. Mm. And then the moment passes, and he doesn't say anything. I don't say anything. In fact, he doesn't come out for 10 years. Wow. And when he does, he calls me up, and, and he says, come visit on the weekend, and, and, and so I do. And, he, and he's hemming and hawing, and he's trying to... It's like really important to tell you. This is hard to tell. Finally, I say, Dad, I know you're gay. And he's amazed. He says, how did you know? And I said, well, that look you gave me 10 years ago, yeah. realizing suddenly how silly, strange that sounded. And he had no memory of it. No memory. And so there I was asking myself, what goes on in body language that the secret life of his entire lifetime could be revealed to me in an instant, no words expressed? Yeah. So I was just, I was amazed by that. And I wanted to understand that better. And then back to age 17, it's Chris, just after Christmas, I'm tobogganing with a couple of friends and we get down the run the first time. It was very icy. Uh, and so I'm showing off and I say, we didn't go fast enough. And, and they say, well, why don't you take it by yourself? So I did. And I didn't make it around the second curve. I fractured my skull, mm. went into a coma um, and I, my life was saved by a, a wonderful neurosurgeon who removed what's called a subdural hematoma a blood clot from my uh, brain. Okay. Um, and when I awoke, he was, of course, very keen to test me to see if I still had my wits about me. Uh, but he didn't test for something very strange that had happened to me. And as the weeks unfolded, I realized I didn't have a good way of talking about it. I didn't really know what was going on, but something had happened where I couldn't read people's emotions anymore. The thing that we all take for granted, that we can look at loved ones and sort of get a feeling for their mood, or when somebody walks into a room really angry, we know what's going on. So we can read the intent. We can read the emotions beneath the words. So we can understand sarcasm and irony and humor and things like that. I couldn't do that anymore. I could hear the words, but I couldn't get any of the intent. So I had to retrain myself, relearn all of that, and that's where the really the lifelong interest in body language and storytelling, uh, because stories put a lot of emotion into the words. And so that was the first thing I latched on to uh, in, in my uh, confused and bewildered state. So that's where it came from. Um, wow. Then I went on to get a Ph.D. in rhetoric and, and, and taught uh, first, taught public speaking, uh, and then started it as a business. So there, there's a couple really interesting things that, that's going on that I want to just take a minute to point out to the audience. So, Nick, that's an amazingly powerful story. Thank you so much for sharing, um, you know, some of those things into your personal life and, and how you were set on this journey. The other thing is, Nick is an expert storyteller. And you see, you know, everybody in the audience who's watching this is that he anchored everything on these three key events that happened and was able to relay the whole reason why he got into this, because we were drawn into the story. And it wasn't something that was just like dropping a bunch of facts and, you know, here it was this and here was that. But it really pulled us in and, and it was quite fascinating. And this is something that all of us can do no matter what level that we're at when we're speaking, uh, is to very just, you know, simply and easily map out what are the key things that you want to share uh, that really connects with the audience 
and puts a little bit of your own personality into it. So I just wanted to to make that point, that observation for everybody. So Nick, um, in addition to this really great start uh, into what it is that you do now, I would love to explore a little bit about some of the challenges that you've had along the way. Um, what are some of the struggles that you've had yourself as somebody who's been committed to mastering the art and science of communication? Uh, is there anything that you can share with those out there who are trying to become better themselves? Yeah, sure. Uh, I remember the first speech I wrote. Uh, I mean, I'd studied it as an academic discipline. I'd, I'd studied Aristotle and Plato, and the ancient Greeks, by the way, are very good at, at storytelling and at making uh, speeches. So there's still a lot to learn uh, from them. But the first time I had to do it in real life, if you will, was uh, when I got drafted very quickly to uh, write speeches for the governor of Virginia uh, because the previous speechwriter had 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 a nervous breakdown. Uh, he was an historian of World War II, and he'd taken to wearing a souvenir Nazi helmet that he had in the office and, and holding the uh, hat rack as a battering ram and charging around shouting, shouting Nazi war slogans. And understandably, this was a bit too much for the, uh, for the <laughs> state police detail assigned to uh, cover the governor. So they got rid of him and they said, help, we need another speechwriter. And, mm-hmm. and so that was how I got my, my start. Um, and the first speech I wrote was a disaster. And the first 12 drafts were disasters. And I was lucky, in a sense, in that the chief of staff was a very tough cookie. Uh, he was a guy who had been uh, the governor's speechwriter before. Yeah. Uh, and, and in fact, that's why he was so keen to get somebody on staff, because he didn't have time to, to step in and be the speechwriter and be the chief of staff at the same time. So he got me in there and he wanted to, be, to come up to speed really quickly. Uh, and so he lacerated the first 12 drafts I wrote. And that was... Uh, that was sort of the hardest professional uh, experience of my life, but I learned fast how to write a speech. Uh, so I don't recommend uh, getting lacerating criticism as a way to learn. It's no fun, but I must say it did bring me up to speed quickly. <laughs> so how did you transition from from speech writing into you know what you're doing now with with the keynote speeches, but also the coaching and and really helping people? become better communicators themselves. Yeah, what you find when you write speeches is, uh, I was a playwright before that, uh, and I wrote five plays, and it's the same thing. You write a a play, and and you see characters saying your words, and sometimes they do it beautifully. Sometimes they do it better than you imagined it, and then sometimes they do it a lot worse. (laughs) The same thing thing happens with a speechwriter. You write a speech, and... And, and the governor, say, gives it. And sometimes he does a great job and other times not so much. And it's in those not so much moments that you start to think about, I could have coached him. Not only could I have written the words, but I could have coached him to do a better job. Yeah. Uh, and then when I left the governor's office and I'd been in politics for a while, uh, then people thought I was an expert. Um, and so they started asking me those questions just naturally. I'd give them the speech and they'd say, how do I deliver this in so many words? Or they'd stand up and do a, do a, a delivery that was so bad, I'd say, look, try this. It's going to work better. So I, I kind of uh, metamorphosed into it just because, uh, uh, first of all, I saw people doing it badly, yeah. and I yeah. wanted to coach them to do it better. Uh, and, and, then, and then second, uh, just because people asked me to, they, they assumed I knew what I was doing. Uh, and, uh, and so I had to learn on the fly. Very interesting. Yeah. So with, with this whole approach that you've got where you're teaching people how to communicate, how to tell their stories, I'm, I'm curious really quick, how th- there's a difference between reading a speech and giving a talk or a presentation, and is there any, any insight or little nuggets you can share with us about the, the difference between those two is being somebody who has written speeches and now coaches people on, on how to be authentic from the stage. Yes, I, people could get away with reading speeches probably even 15 years ago. Nowadays, if you do, you look hopelessly dull, like, like you're just not authentic. You're not connecting with the audience. So I would say the first thing to do is never, ever read a speech. Never, ever read a speech if, if you have any desire to be authentic at all. People expect a conversation these days. It's, it's really essential. 
Uh, and so what you need to do is, uh, that doesn't mean you don't practice. That doesn't mean you don't know that speech cold, but write it out as bullet points, um, have the support there so you won't be afraid your mind's going to go dry. You won't be afraid you're going to forget your lines, but have just enough support so that you're not reading it. Rather, you're speaking it from memory. Uh, you you see a phrase that, that jogs the complete sentence. You see a, 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 a header and that suggests a topic of conversation. Um, and the other thing is, to tell stories because stories we know from our gut, those are stories have an emotional connection. They get lodged in the deep part of our brain. We can tell those without a lot of notes. Um, and, and so you can just cue yourself, you know, tell the governor's story and then, uh, and start talking. Um, whereas if it's, if it's lists, if it's an intellectual approach, if it's, uh, if it's just a series of facts, then you're in for memorization and the audience is in for a dull time. Yeah. Now, what about, and especially somebody who comes from a background of, of playwriting, is there anything that can be learned from, from actors and actresses of the stage where you, know, you have set lines, you have a story that you're, you're following as a character in that story, and you have to memorize those lines, but then there's something magical that happens for those who, who have a unique talent where they're taking those you know, words on a page and internalizing them and making them their own and part of who they are. And then, you know, the basic gist of what the playwright has written is delivered. But sometimes there's those embellishments, those personal touches. Um, is there anything that, that can come out of that for us as, as people that maybe we're just getting started? We feel comfortable with writing out what it is that we want to say, but we don't want to do it in a way that's kind of rote or robotic. Yes, what actors do uh, is they connect to the emotional reality. That's really the work of an actor. And they get very uh, fluent and, and uh, quick at queuing up an emotion. That's what they're good at. And, and that's difficult to do. That takes practice. Most of us can't access our emotions that quickly and that fluently. And, and that, in, in a sense, artificially. In other words, they have to do it according to the script. If the script calls for fury, then they have to come up with fury. Um, if the, the script calls for love, then they have to come up with love. Right? So they get very good at that. What you can learn from them is to work on not only the words of the script or the, uh, the speech that you're trying to give, but also work on what's the underlying emotional attitude I want to convey to the audience. And how do I invoke that? What part of my memory can I draw on to find that, um, that emotion so that I invoke it at the right time? If you can do that, then you can bring to life your speech in a powerful way. Excellent. Well, Nick, I want to move now to the part of our discussion where we talk about your unique perspective. You've already given us some great nuggets, but a couple of questions that I had specifically for you, uh, the first being really diving into this idea of the secrets of body language and nonverbal cues. I know you talk about this a lot. You write a lot about this, this topic as well. Is there, if there was one thing that you would give the audience today that is some insight into what it is that we do when we speak and some of the things that we, we maybe do non-verbally or physical gestures that we make, what are some of the things that we should be aware of uh, just right out of the gate, top level, best tips that you've got? What happens... When a speaker goes in front of an audience, naturally enough, you're human, you're nervous. We're all familiar with that, the fight or flight syndrome. I write a lot about this, the issue of adrenaline. We just saw it with Peyton Manning choking in the, in the Super Bowl, and I wrote a blog post on that. Um, so we've got that, um, that nervousness, and we define it as such. We define it as a bad thing. Uh, and so the first thing to do is to redefine it as something good and useful. Adrenaline, that's the stuff that gives you the energy, that makes your brain go faster, that makes you stand straighter and feel more excited. You need some of that, but you've got to channel it and control it. And the issue is if you just uh, kind of soldier through and don't work with it and don't uh, learn to master it, then you're going to walk on stage with that vague feeling of nervousness. And maybe for you, it's more than vague. Maybe it's sheer terror. I mean, everybody has a range, right? And your body is going to give you away. It's going to signal that terror or that nervousness to the audience. And here's the thing. We all have these things called mirror neurons in our head so that what happens is when I share an emotion, when I experience an emotion, then I share it with you. I leak my emotion to you and vice versa. 
and the strong one's going to dominate. So imagine this, you've got a bunch of people in the audience and they're just sitting there waiting. They're not experiencing anything in particular. Maybe they're a little excited, maybe not. Maybe they're bored. Maybe it's been a long day and they're tired. And you come in with all your nervous energy. That's what's going to leak to the audience. And think about how that affects communication. If what you're leaking to the audience is just mild terror, how well does that affect the chance for people to share communication? Do you want to communicate with somebody when you're terrified? No, you want to run. You want to get out of there. You want to get to a low terror state. You want to go somewhere else. So the first thing to do is to get a handle on that adrenaline, redefine it as something good, make it positive and channel it into positive energy so that you leak that to the audience. You, you commune with the audience in a good way. Yeah. yeah. I know I've coached a lot of people on, on that very idea that, the audience is going to feel what you're feeling. And there's two types of emotions that are very contagious. And one is nervousness. Audience is going to feel that. The other is passion. Yeah, You're able to go in there with a passion for what it is that your message is and, and really tap into what resonates with you the most about that message. That excitement, that energy is going to be contagious and, and your audience is definitely going to feel it. And it may even become passionate them, themselves about that topic or that message. Yeah, that's a great point is you've got to focus on that passion. That's what you should be experiencing as you walk up on stage, as you walk out there to first connect with that audience. That's a yeah. great point. That's, that's what you need. I would add two others mm -hmm. uh, from vaudeville. Make them laugh, make them cry. Mm -hmm. If you can, it, I don't mean to sound cynical or manipulative about this at all, but if you can get choked up, if there's a part in your speech that taps into some uh, real uh, deeper emotion, some sorrow or some uh, grief or something like that. That's very powerful. That People really share that. And, and it's more powerful if you try to hold it back than if you start blubbering, sobbing uh, on stage. So uh, that choked up emotion is something that trans transmits to people very powerfully. And then, of course, laughter is, uh, is universally shareable and, and a wonderful thing to exchange. So that's the other other way to go. I would always caution people, never start your speech with a joke. That used to be the advice. And that's when you're most nervous and you'll blow the punchline and then it'll be a doom loop. You'll, uh, you'll think, oh my God, I blew the joke. Um, the audience is going to hate me now. And you'll go down this uh, horrible train of thought. So don't do that. Don't start with a joke. But as you begin to relax, get into it a few minutes in, if you can find some humor that comes naturally out of the, out of the speech, then great, go for that, because people love to laugh. And the larger the audience, the more they want to laugh. Great. Well, that kind of dovetails nicely with the next question I had for you, and that was around the idea of authenticity as well as charisma. What are some tips that you would, might give us related to how can we be authentic without you know, pushing the emotional triggers like you were just describing, but doing so in a way that isn't contrived or, you know, something that it's like, oh, you know, we're at this moment in time, I'm going to do this. And then at this moment in time, I'm going to do that. Um, but tapping into who we are as individuals, being real people from the stage or from, you know, in front of the room, um, as well as is tapping into what it is that, that is exciting about us and our personalities that connects and resonates with the audience. I think authenticity is, is table stakes these days. I think if you're not willing to be authentic, then you're just, you're not going to connect, connect with the audience. I think we expect that we, th there was a study I saw the other day that I have no idea how accurate it is, but it said we get something like 20,000 marketing messages a day. <laughs> and if it's even anything like that, if it's even half that, then it it's, means we're awash in marketing messages. So we have a very high BS filter. We, we don't listen to a lot of that stuff. We just automatically, we automatically shut it out. And what gets through that is authenticity. So I think that's essential today. And what you need to do is figure out what's a piece of my story that I'm willing to share with that audience. You get to choose what the piece is, but it had better be relevant and it had better be real. And if it isn't, then I don't think uh, you're in the game today. I just think that, as I say, those are table stakes. In, in, terms, of in terms of charisma, um, charisma is something there's a lot of sort of mystique about, and we pay famous actors a huge amount of money because they're charismatic, and we elect the more charismatic of the two candidates for president and so on and so forth. So charisma is a big deal. It's actually something very simple. And that is, it's simple to describe. It isn't easy to do. <laughs> 
Uh, but it's what charisma is, is focused emotion. And we are all charismatic just in our ordinary lives on rare occasions. When we walk into a room and our, our spouse or our significant other is in, in the room and that significant other says, just looks at us and says, what happened? Because we're just brimming over with some news, either bad or good. Mm -hmm. right? That's a moment when we're charismatic. Charisma is focus. It's emotional focus. If you can focus an emotion and walk on stage with that focused emotion, all eyes will go to you. And that's why I say it's really important to know what that underlying emotion is for, the, uh, for your speech. And it's better if it's something strong. That's what really draws the attention. So start your speech with something you're angry about or you're passionate about or you're overjoyed about. Don't go for, eh, don't go for mediocre. Go yeah. for, for broke. But that's, if you can focus your emotions, and that does take training, as I say. It's easy to say, but hard to do. It, it, but if you can focus your emotions, you can be charismatic. Not only Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, but everybody can be charismatic when they train themselves to focus their emotions. Sound advice. Well, Nick, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll come back to wrap up our discussion with the rapid-fire Q&A. Struggling with feeling comfortable in front of an audience when you present? Or maybe you're confident, but you have difficulty stumbling over filler words like um, ah, uh, and ah. Uh. Well, you can start kicking ass today by signing up for our weekly VIP updates. As a bonus, you'll also receive 11 free tips that will uncover six psychological secrets to public speaking, plus five tips on how to stop using filler words. Go to whatthespeak.com slash VIP. All right, we're back with our rapid fire Q&A. And Nick, I would love to ask you, are you a slide or no slide kind of guy when you give a presentation? I prefer no slides because it's a distraction most of the time. You're asking the audience to look in two directions. And if you're good, doing a good job telling a compelling story, then I'd much rather the audience look at you than look at the slides. Some people make them work. Seth Godin does a great job with slides. Most people know. Yep. Got it. Okay. As someone who speaks and you, you work with a lot of great speakers, I'm sure you've studied many, many great speakers. Who is one individual that has inspired you the most and why is that? Well, uh, I mean, if you, if you want me to be honest, it's Martin Luther King and the I Have a Dream speech and, and any other bit of video of Martin Luther King I can get my hands on because he is such an amazing, focused, wonderful, natural speaker. When I say natural, meaning he's preached for 35 years before he became that natural, wonderful uh, speaker. So he's my number one go-to guy. I mean, the magic thing about... Uh, recent years is that we have the TED Talks. And so I see a lot of wonderful TED Talks. And, and Benet Brown is my new hero. I think she did something really courageous in her TED Talk. Awesome. Okay, so what's the funniest, craziest, silliest, most bizarre thing that's ever happened to you when you've been standing before an audience? Is there, there any, anything goofy that you can share? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would... I'd say lots of goofy moments, but uh, um, the the one that comes to mind is uh, is giving a speech, and it was this was a it's a little complicated to set it up, so I'll I'll be quick. It's a it was a benefit thing for a theatrical group I was involved in, and we were all going to give speeches, and we were all required to come up with uh, with uh, audience and sponsors and things because the idea was to raise money. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, everybody had to come up with six uh, sponsors, and and we were going to have something like three hundred people there. That was the plan. So we rented the room and everything, um, and I was the first one on. I come charging out, and there are six people there in the audience. What do you do when there are six people? Um, and it was a completely different occasion. It was not what we were expecting. And it turned out that uh, nobody had come through with any of their speakers. I mean, one was mine and one was somebody else's. So it was a complete disaster. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. What did you do? Um, we turned it into a conversation. That's all you can do when there's six people. We all just sat around and... We broke into the uh, the wine that was meant for later, a little earlier than we had intended. And, and uh, when, when you don't have an audience, when the audience doesn't show up, when it's not a, a public setting and you're expecting one, then you turn it into a conversation. Yeah. That's all you can do. Good. Well, the other thing that I've got here for you that I wanted to ask was, as somebody who 
you know, your life is, is, is surrounded around this idea of communication. But I'm really curious, is there anything related to the impact that your ability to communicate has had on your career and on your business? Um, you know, what's, what's kind of the, the big thing that's come out of this and, and your commitment to being a, a, as excellent of a communicator as you can? Um, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but the biggest deal for me is, is, uh, back when I was teaching and I had students, um, that I was teaching at Princeton university uh, and I, I had students that I coached, um, and one of them really got the, uh, the idea of body language and really wanted to work with it. And then she had a chance to interview for the, uh, Rhodes scholarship and the Marshall uh, scholarship, which are big deals, uh, uh, in that world. Um, and she was the first person in history. I coached her extensively on the tricks of body language in a job interview, which is what it was essentially. And she was the first person to, uh, to win both wow. the Rhodes and the Marshall at, at, in Princeton's history. So that was, that was very rewarding. When you, when you see a student or a coachee, somebody you work with do a great job, that's really what it's all about. It's, it's seeing that happen. So that's, for me, that's even more powerful than, Although I love it, getting up in front of an audience and, and having a good time with an audience, it's uh, it's even cooler when when somebody hits it out of the park like that. Yeah, you know the the question is really based on like the success that you've had by being able to be a communicator that's successfully mastered that. But I think your your answer is fantastic because it's beyond just you know the success that you have in life. It's being able to really help those that you're working with to be able to achieve their, their dreams, their goals, et cetera. And that impact is huge. All right. So we lost the connection, but Nick, just one last question. Um, what's the advice that you would give somebody who's just starting off? They want to become a better communicator. One tip that you think everybody who's just trying to go to that next level, that's the most effective tool or resource or tip uh, anything that you can share would be awesome. Yeah, I would say start by uh, monitoring yourself for a while. Just notice how you show up when you walk into a room, um, when you are in a meeting, if you're in, a, in the business world, uh, whatever your daily round is, just notice how do you carry yourself? Do you, are your shoulders slumped? Are you inward? Are you, uh, are you standing up straight? Are you energetic? Do you stride into a room? Just try to get a sense of uh, who you are and, and what you're like. Because the first step in becoming a successful communicator is self-awareness. So it begins, with, it's all about you. <laughs> and then once you know how you're coming across and how you're carrying yourself, then you can start to realize how you affect others. Because communication is about touching other people. There's no communication unless they get it at the other end, right? So uh, that's where it's got to uh, start. You start with personal understanding. Uh, and that's, that's not easy to do. We don't, we don't like to confront the dark places, the dark parts of ourselves. We don't like to, to focus on the things we don't do as well. But we, you've got to know the whole you, the whole picture. Get used to that, get comfortable with that, and then you can start figuring out how that's going to affect other people and you can become a good communicator. Yeah, it really is hard for, for so many of us to, you know, even if we record an audio of ourselves or if it's a video, to go back and watch that and see, like, wow, I, I sound like that? Or, oh, why, why do I make that gesture? And it, it is difficult, but it's definitely the first step on a, a long journey to be able to identify those things and then to be able to work on those things slowly and methodically through practice and rehearsal but it makes a world of difference and allows you to really unlock who you are and share your message. So, well, Nick, it's been a, a great time with you. I would love to keep talking with you. There's so many great things that, that you've got um, that, that could be shared, but thank you again for your time. Uh, we'll have the show notes over at whattospeak.com. We'll include links to your website, your blog, your social media profile, and any other resources. So make sure that you check that out. And again, Nick, you're, you're somebody who kicks ass when you speak, present, or pitch, and it really means a lot that you were on the show. So thanks again. Thanks, Brian. It was a great pleasure. It was great fun to chat with you. Nice job. Thank you.
If you liked what today's guest had to share in our discussion, you may want to grab an audio copy of their latest book for free by going to wtsaudiobook.com. That's wtsaudiobook.com. All right, here we go with the outro. Thanks so much for joining us today on What the Speak. Be sure to visit whatthespeak.com for show notes on every episode and to sign up for our email list to stay updated on resources that'll help you kick ass when you speak, present, or pitch. 